Uh, to everyone for for joining um, I, I this is my first one of these so I appreciate all the patience with any technical things I get wrong as this goes along uh, the other two people that you see in our Brady Bunch style presentation uh, Nate Hodling uh, he is the co-founder and executive producer at Portal A um, and Brad Griffiths down on the at least my bottom left uh, he is the senior director of sports marketing at the marketing arm so thanks guys for for joining in I really appreciate it Thanks, uh, and uh, I would encourage people to, uh, I, we'll be, we're going to ideally open this up to take questions from people. Uh, we have four main topics that we want to wrestle with a little bit today, uh, and then as much as possible, open it up to questions, uh, which I believe you can do in the, uh, in, you know, on, on your, your screen and leave those for us, and, and we will get to those as, as much as we can. Um, so a little bit of data that I wanted to kind of frame this with, because so much of this conversation is related to the uncertainty that we all feel in everything that we're doing um, in our daily lives, but certainly as it relates to sports. Um, so, so some polling that was done among sports executives and sports people by front office sports uh, in the middle of the month, only about 21% of the people uh, that were touched for this, uh, for this polling thought that uh, it would be at least 60 days before leagues would resume play. By the 23rd, that number had jumped up to about 55%. And again, that's a week ago. And I think if you did that again now, it would be closer to 80 or 90% are, are anticipating something longer than 60 days before, um, before the games come back. So my first question to, to put to you guys is, what exactly are athletes doing while the sports have stopped. Nate, what, what are you seeing? Yeah, um, well, first of all, thanks, thanks so much for having me, uh, Brand Storytelling and, and Brian for, for doing this. Um, we're, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start off like I do on every Zoom call I'm on right now. This is weird, uh, this is a weird, <laughs> weird experience, um, but yeah, just get that out in the open. But um, yeah, really excited to be talking about this. I think we're all learning about these issues in real time. So anyone who pretends to be an expert on COVID-19 related uh, media issues is, is lying to you. But um, I'm very glad to kind of share some of our experiences and uh, hear from, from Brad and others as well. So yeah, um, on the athlete side, so a little bit our company, um, Portal A, we are uh, based in Los Angeles and San Francisco. We're a content agency. Um, we started 10 years ago when my partners and I, uh, who grew up together, um, were at traditional entertainment jobs and realized that uh, the companies we were at were not addressing YouTube, Instagram, uh, and, and the kind of deluge of, of digital content that was changing everything. And so we jumped into this space and, um, and ever since then have been uh, working with brands, with platforms, um, and, and making content for this new audience. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, adaptation is really in our DNA because we started as a company that, that was making content for these new platforms that were defining themselves as they were building. And so, um, you know, we, this has been a really fascinating time for us. Uh, about two years ago, we started to partner with um, celebrities and especially um, athletes uh, to build their YouTube channels and, and their digital presence and uh, building those relationships and seeing how they're being activated and changed during this, this time uh, is super interesting. Um, obviously, on social media every day, you see uh, a thousand videos of athletes you know, juggling rolls of toilet paper and uh, uh, you know, just staying active and staying busy and working out. Um, I think the, the sense I'm getting from the athlete community is, is definitely um, when is this, when can we get back to doing what we love to do? Um, but also uh, underneath that is, you know, how do we uh, be present in this moment and communicate with our fans uh, and, and give back in ways that we can. So, um, you know, I've seen a lot of teams around athletes kind of come together and 
um, build out a, a, a plan just for this kind of three month period um, so they can all the projects that they've been sitting on um, and usually mm -hmm. wait to the off season, they can kind of activate during this time. So as a company that is partnering with athletes on digital content, um, it presents some really interesting opportunities for us. One of the things I thought was really interesting that, that I saw was the, the conversation that, that Steph Curry had with uh, Anthony Fauci um, and just what that means and what it represents for the voice and, the, and, and uh, that athletes have now because that's a recognition on, on, on part of the part of the administration or the, that Steph Curry speaks to a different demographic and a different group of people. It's hard to me to imagine 10 or 15 years ago, an athlete having that kind of platform. Um, what does it say just about the trends that we've seen generally uh, that athletes can have, can take advantage of now that, you know, events like that with something like Steph have, have happened? Yeah, I think you hit it on the head. A lot of the trends we've seen within the relationships between athletes and leagues and fans over the last five to 10 years is sort of like trapped in ember in this moment and, and also amplified because there's just this white space where there are no games. So um, the, those conversations just get so much more coverage. So, you know, the, the trend of athletes becoming creators, owning their own audience on social media and, and places like Players Tribune, um, bypassing media outlets in some ways and, and leagues um, and going direct to fans, you know, that's been a huge trend. Um, another trend, you know, in this, in our politicized age, uh, sports and athletes in some ways can be the last respite or the last place people can come together. And so with the Stefan Fauci interview, it was a really interesting way for those two mm -hmm. trends to, to collide and, and um, just yeah, get amplified out, uh, you know, his using his platform, which he's built over the course of that time. I think he's up to 15 million followers on Instagram and, uh, and a million on YouTube. Um, and then, yeah, people, there's so many people in the comments writing, like, you know, I got more out of this interview than watching Fox news or CNN for, uh, you know, a week. So, mm -hmm. um, being able to like really kind of get to the heart of what's happening in the country right now. Is yeah. Like, and it's, it, it's interesting because it, it speaks, it's not necessarily a, Thing that's tied to a specific brand or a brand partner, but it does speak to to Steph himself and the kind of presentation he's making. Brad, you work really closely with a lot of Olympic athletes, and this is a uh, an unusual time to say the least. At least there's there is some understanding of, that the games will be postponed uh, till next year. But Olympic athletes occupy a particularly unique space in that their relevance rises and falls with the game. What happens now with these athletes when the games have been postponed? Yeah, yeah, and that, that's, you know, it's a really interesting situation that we're living and breathing with our clients right now. Um, you know, I think the, the, the key is what you mentioned, Brian, which is the fact that we've, we've finalized some clarity on when these Olympics are actually going to take place. I think the uncertainty of, of, of the postponement was really causing pause on both the brand and athlete side. So at least for athletes and brands to be able to wrap their head around a timeline one year from now, I think is really crucial to both the, 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 the athletes and the brands. Um, like you said, the, the Olympic cycle is, 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 it's quick and it's global and it comes and goes. And you know, I think athletes are doing whatever they need to be doing to stay competitive, stay in shape. But I think from, from a, from a brand standpoint, you know, I think we've really seen an Olympic community come together. I think the, the, the global partners of, of the Olympic Games, like P&G and Visa and Coca-Cola, are, are really united on the front of doing the right thing and making sure that their, their athlete deals are honored and that they're providing flexibility wherever athletes need it or, or want it. And, and you know, I think that feeling is reciprocated on the athletes and that brands are, are you know, listening to them. Um, so it's, it's, it's obviously a very fluid situation, but I think, you know, the, 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 the assurance that athletes are hoping for are that brands will not only honor their deals, but they'll hope, the, the hope is that they'll continue to press forward with their marketing plans next year and give athletes that exposure that they really, really um, thrive on during the games.
Yeah, and in the meantime, everybody can engage in the, like, I, I'm not sure people saw that, that great uh, post from Lolo Jones where the day the Olympics were, were postponed and she came and she just poured out the entire bowl of uh, bag of candy into her bowl that was just dove in like it was cereal. I, I enjoyed that yeah. one. Um, sticking with that, though, uh, Brad, for the second one, like, our, our, the next question I think we really wanted to explore is this idea of what happens when production stops. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there is so much tied to the sports calendar, whether it's the Olympics, uh, the NCAA tournament, uh, you know, the NFL is coming up soon. How do brands respond to the uncertainty of the sports calendar and, and the lack of, uh, of ability to really understand when, can, when production might begin and stop? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there are certain, you know, tying back to the Olympics, I think there are certain partners that are fortunate enough to have created a lot of their content already. Mm -hmm. And they're in positions where they can just bank that content and then roll it out next year when the time is right. I think the challenge is really more looking at brands that like to activate with the NBA and, and baseball and the NFL and understanding how do they approach these next few months. Um, you know, I think the way we're looking at it is that it's best to have a best case scenario, which is some return to normalcy in the next few months, paired with some really rock solid contingencies. Um, a lot of brands are either not going to be able or willing to execute elaborate productions this summer. And that might cause the advertising landscape during the NBA finals, during the NFL regular season to look a lot different. Um, you know, we could see a decrease in traditional high production value content running during these games. And we might see an uptick in non-traditional content. Maybe we're seeing more iPhone content. We might be seeing brands reach out for user content and collaging that together. We might see brands taking on animated content approaches. So I think it's definitely going to have a sweeping effect on the type of content that we're consuming in the next few months. But really, for brands to protect themselves, they need to operate under a best case scenario where if they are able to move forward with production over the next few months, they have that plan in place. But in, in a scenario where they don't have the opportunity to execute a production shoot, they need to have some some really rock solid ideas of how they can work around it. Yeah, and, and Nate, I think that's that's an, a really interesting area because you know, as somebody you know, coordinating between the brands and the athletes and the athletes themselves, how how do you strategize and plan and create those contingencies that 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 Brad is talking about when there? I mean, there there's almost nothing to hang those contingencies on at this point because we are so uncertain about everything. Yeah. Yeah, we, you know, our, our company does, you know, what, what I guess is now called remote production um, with, with our athlete partners and, and some other partners, but historically it's been about 10% or maybe even less of the overall work that we do. Um, and, and during those, you know, fateful weeks in late February, early March, where things were getting pushed back and pushed back, and then one thing would get canceled, and, and basically all of the physical production that constitutes the 90% of uh, our work as a content agency um, was either put off till the fall or, or canceled altogether. Um, you know, I, I was really proud of the way that our team responded um, and adapted to the changing environment. Um, like I said, it's, it's kind of built into our DNA to, to be, um, you know, in, think in that way. But, um, you know, we, have, we put together a remote production capabilities deck you know, within a week or so of all this happening, we just actually got some coverage on it um, today on it on that age, uh, and really just laying out the best practices for you know what has always been for brands and for agencies like ours. Um, you know, the ten percent of what we do, but let's take that ten percent out and really focus on it and think about what it means to be premium in in the space of. Uh, you know, having athletes record iPhone videos or um, sending them kits where they can record their own content. Um, things like we're doing right now, uh, Zoom calls and recording stuff that way, animation, um, and, and really started to focus more on that because, you know, for the foreseeable future, that's going to be how companies like ours are, are judged and how, um, you know, how we get new clients and, and all that. So it's, it's just something that's become very quickly uh like central to our business it raises a question too of, of voice because you know so many of these things are um 
unorthodox to say the least in terms of how how a brand might want to put out their messaging or you know what form is it going to be something really polished uh, is it going to be something uh, a little more guerrilla style whatever it might be filmed at home how do brands best approach that in terms of finding the right voice finding the right tone still being able to get their messaging out uh, in an age that might be more experimental than people are used to. Uh, Brad, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think, you know, to start, I'm, I'm, I'm of the opinion that brands, some brands will, will put pause on their activity and, and there's various reasons for why they want or need to do that. But I'm, I'm very much of the opinion that when things do return to some sense of normalcy, fans are going to be bloodthirsty for sports. And, that is an opportune time for brands to capitalize. And, and so for the brands that aren't really sure how to press forward or, or may be a little bit less inclined to be experimental in advertising nature, I just think that they should keep in mind the fact that a lot of brands are gonna be experimental. There will be a lot of leaders in the space um, with some followers, but there will be brands that are gonna look to explore experimental tactics to get content produced and shot and aired over the next few months. And I think from a, from, a, from a brand standpoint, I think it's just really important for brands to look at themselves in the mirror and understand who they are. Because this is really not the time for a brand to reinvent their identity, um, but rather really lean into who they already are. So if a brand isn't experimental by nature, this is an opportunity for them to go bigger and better. And I think for brands that are more conservative by nature, I think this is an opportunity for them to learn that the landscape's gonna shift and they might need to adapt over time. Nate, do you think that applies to the athletes themselves, that same basic philosophy? Yeah, I, I do. Um, I, that was really well put. I think both for talent and brands, you know, the key word that we are always talking about is authenticity. Um, and authenticity is a slippery concept. Um, and sometimes when you try to be authentic, you come off as inauthentic. And, it is it's subjective but to us it it's it com comes down to consistency um and and then being present and in the moment so with consistency thinking about what have you been doing historically um you know when we think about how brands are reacting or talent reacting in this moment what are you know what are you doing historically so just taking a couple examples you know with stephen curry uh he, you know, his pillars of unanimous, the company he started, have been family, uh, faith, and sports. Uh, and so when he, his team got together to think about what they were going to pursue during this time, um, you know, doing something like a, a remote church service um, was an obvious one for them. Um, you know, they're building a few ideas in, in the sports space and then you know, sharing, giving back to, to Bay Area families was really important to them. So mm -hmm. just kind of thinking about what your mission is, and even if it's slightly, it's, it's obviously through a new prism now, um, uh, just kind of relying on that. But then the second part of, of that being present and in the moment, um, it's, it's, it's hard for a lot of brands to be thinking quickly um, and reacting quickly to something that's unfolding in real time and feeling like they're going to get it wrong. Um, but for our, the partners we're talking to, we're trying to gently push, you know, as long as you have, have a foundation of consistency of, of, you know, leaning into things that have been historically part of your brand or your identity, um, trying to be a little more um, quick moving and reactive than you're accustomed to, uh, we, we think is wise during this time because people are looking for solidarity mm -hmm. and, you know, the vacuum of the voices they normally hear from is a little, you know, freaking people out. And so the way that like a Jimmy Kimmel or a Trevor Noah are, are taking up that space um, is, I think, inspiring others to do something similar. Yeah, we're going to get into some of these questions about, you know, uh, purpose branding, community-minded messaging and things like that before we're done. But I, I, one of the most fascinating parts to me, like the games have stopped. It feels like forever. It's less, it's, it's still, the NBA uh, was March 12th, I think it was. March 11th, March 12th, something like yeah, that. Yeah, it, it feels like been, six might have been a thing. It, could, like it, like, it could have been six years. I don't know. Yeah. And now, you know, it's, then it was the NHL and MLS and the international leagues and, you know, um, you know, it was, we, we heard, you know, the, you know, I was doing some radio stuff where 
we kind of latched on to Australian rules football and because they were still going and then they stopped like a day later, like even that right. day went down. Where are the fans and how do brands find them at a time like this when their normal conduits aren't there, Nate? Where do you think you can find them? Well, I think if, if we're being honest, I think a lot of the traditional sports fans aren't, aren't paying attention to sports right now. I mean, I, like a zombie, go to ESPN.com probably three mm -hmm. times a day anyways, just to see Instagram videos of people in their houses. But um, one thing we heard just anecdotally from our agents at WME is that, uh, that on the Food Network, Guy Fieri is like doubling his viewership because sports fans, you know, predominantly men are like looking for other places to uh to spend their time and so there have been some unintended consequences in that way um i, I do think though that there is there is a culture around sports that persists um and you know we're seeing it a little bit in the coverage uh the the stay-at-home coverage that espn themselves is doing and uh and there there is a space to um, respond to this moment through the world of sports, even though sports aren't happening. Um, but I think it's more in a uh, just kind of an awareness of the moment rather than uh, trying to take advantage of a huge influx of fans to somewhere other than live sports, because I'm, I'm not sure that's happening. Yeah, Brad, what do you think about this idea of kind of finding fans uh, at a time where there aren't any sports? Yeah, I mean, I think the numbers show that fans are just consuming content right now. Um, people are watching Netflix, they are online, they're watching TV. And I think if a brand wants to find their consumers, it's, it's probably not a bad strategy to be providing content. And whether that's partnering with a team or a, an athlete that creates content on their end, or whether they're more of a collaborator and provider in that front, um, I think brands can really be zooming in on what is valuable content that we can provide people that is helpful, a distraction, fun, you know, well-minded, all, all of those things, you know, it, it are really fundamental to, you're not, you, this is not an opportunity to sell a product. It's an opportunity to provide value. And, and, mm -hmm. and I'm seeing value right now as, content that people can consume because they got nothing else to do. Yeah. It's funny. Like I, I just got something, we got a lot of questions coming in on this topic. So I'll kind of wrap my thought into the, in some of these questions we're getting. Um, we've seen uh, NASCAR doing virtual racing with their actual racers in the sim, you know, simulators, which these guys really do use uh, to learn tracks and, and, and things like that. Um, the NBA this weekend, I believe it is, is going to do a 2K tournament. That was just announced. Um, I got something in my inbox today about a, a panel, I guess, similar to this one, talking about gambling and esports. Uh, and not that necessarily brands would want to be involved in the gambling part of it, but gambling brings visibility, raises the profile, and then esports become a bigger deal. Do you guys see the landscape shifting at all to where esports and, and some of these non traditional avenues become a bigger deal uh, and more relevant, certainly during this period of time, but maybe even going forward? Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if 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 there was ever a thought that the the rapid ascent of esports would plateau at some point, um, this situation kind of alters that trajectory. Um, esports now become even more relevant and popular than they were, um, and 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 like we're seeing with with a lot of current athletes, a lot of guys are gamers, and 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 it you have to assume that it would make sense for there to be some kind of marriage between professional gamers and professional athletes. And, you know, you see leagues like the NBA that are so at the forefront of, of, how, of how to take advantage of those opportunities. I, I, I don't think it's going to revert back to a more traditional um, division of esports and current sports. I feel like even the more traditional properties like baseball and golf, I, I think at some point are all going to need to embrace the idea that esports has a community within that sport and they should embrace it rather than not neglect it, but kind of let, let it be a separate mm -hmm. entity. Yeah, I, I don't know enough about esports as a professional, uh, the, the professional side of it to comment on that as much, but I can say from 
the athlete side, um, the idea of athletes, you know, athletes as creators, we talked about athletes as, as gaming creators. Um, I think we're going to come out of this period with a whole new crop of athletes who think about gaming as part of their overall strategy. Uh, you know, there was a Luka Doncic uh, tweet that went viral where he was like desperately trying to log into, you know, every service he could to just pass the time. Um, we work with De'Aaron Fox of the Sacramento Kings, and I think he's never been busier. You know, he's playing in tournaments like three times a day, uh, and there's there's so much interest on that side. Uh, I'm, I'll be really interested to see how that NBA 2K tournament does and, and how it's covered because I think that could be something that's replicated even when sports are back on. It just seems like such an obvious thing right. that, um, that I think we'll see a lot more of that uh, and, and – and you know, NBA players owning their gaming identity uh, to be to be a bigger part of sports. Yeah, because it's funny, like because you know these guys, especially you know the NBA, the, the, you know y- y- these are young people traveling a lot. They play they, they game all the time, uh, but they're not necessarily the professionals who do it. There's a difference between the guys who you know play 2K for a living and you know Darren Fox, Josh Hart, some of these other young players who love this stuff. But I think it's 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 impossible, Nate, to overlook the ability for athletes to use it as a conduit to fans because these games are so collective and, and you know, they connect to so many people. Um, you really think it's a, it's a way for them to sort of advance their voice and advance their brand and things like that? Yeah, and, and tap into an audience that is maybe adjacent to a, mm-hmm. a, a fan base that would watch an NBA game. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in how esports and, and gaming fans and pro sports fans interact. There does seem to be like a bit of a firewall between them, but maybe more overlap than there has been in the past. Um, but yeah, I think the NBA does seem to be really focused on bringing that audience over. And I think for individual athletes, uh, they see that as an opportunity as well. Um, I want to I want to get to to uh, a question here before we get to our our final topic that I think is is important. Um, should we just pull it up on the right screen here? Um, the you know the, we've talked a little bit about um, sort of what things might look like um, and 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 how the landscape could play out. Jared Blitz asks uh, to Brad. You mentioned sort of planning for worst case scenarios. It's obviously no it's impossible to know exactly what that looks like, but what do you think is the worst case? Like what is that possible contingency that brands might want to be planning for? Is it no sports at all on the calendar in 2020 uh, into 2021? Yeah. I mean, I think anybody's guess is as good as mine, but you know, I, I, I think it's naive to think that the idea of sports not existing in 2020 is, is outrageous. Mm-hmm. I think it's very much if we think about you know how brands can be smart and how they can plan for multiple different scenarios. I think if best case scenario is a return to normalcy in a couple of months, I think worst case scenario is probably right around where Jared's thinking, which is brands. I mean, not brands, teams, leagues, and events will at some point feel like the altered version of what they want to produce for fans is too much of a deviation from the sport itself that they'll just have to cancel. And I think we've seen, we've seen certain leagues be more forward thinking than others in ways that they can adapt their schedules. I think Adam Silver is kind of at the forefront of, mm-hmm. he's very open-minded about how the remainder of the NBA season plays out. I'm not as certain that, you know, the commissioner of MLB and NFL will be as open-minded. And I think there's going to come a boiling point where, leagues have to decide, all right, this is too different from what we can present as a viewing experience, and we just need to cut ties and move on to the next year. So if you're thinking worst case scenario, I think, you know, there's there's a very real possibility that major leagues um, just suspend operations and start up again next year. Uh, and Nate, what do you think the fact that these they could come back as just different than what we're used to? I mean, the, the NBA is sort of naturally more portable than the NFL. It's naturally more portable uh, than Major League Baseball just because you need less space and there are fewer athletes, just athletes to move. Um, but what do you, how do you think it impacts 
storytelling when the games themselves might not look like what we're used to when they come back? Yeah, it's, it's completely uncharted territory. Um, and the whole idea of athletes having off field, off court personas is that they have an on court on field right. persona that they use as a backstop. Um, you know, we're, a, we're a gladiator here. We're a hero here. So we can be a normal person here and it's actually kind of cool. Um, but if the, the former isn't happening, then it, it kind of throws the whole thing out of whack. So um, yeah, I, you know, hearing the rumors of the NBA doing their playoff, uh, NBA doing their playoffs on a single site uh, without fans uh, it, it's hard for me to imagine that um, just because of the way that image would be seared into people's minds. I mean, even, even just growing up during like the lockout um, of, of different sports uh, and, and the memory of that and how weird that was and how I think it changed people's perception of the sport a little bit. I think the image of a playoff team being done without fans in the stadium I don't know. I, I think for the overall perception of the leagues, I don't know. I don't know if that would go forward, but maybe, it's, maybe it will. And it might even vary by sport. Um, yeah. You know, uh, and, and there's, there, there are a hundred more conversations about ways to deliver the product to, uh, to the people in those situations that I'm sure we'll, we'll have, uh, and unfortunately we'll have the time to have. Uh, but I want to turn to uh, both of you guys, made some reference to this with our very first question about what athletes are doing. How do brands engage responsibly in the type of community minded branding, the type of, of, of purpose driven um, campaigns or whatever it might be at a time when those things are tricky uh, and they're, and they're, there's a difficult area to navigate. Uh, Nate, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, a couple thoughts, um, like we were, Brad and I were talking about before, the idea of being authentic and, and staying true to your identity and maybe pulling out elements that maybe weren't on the forefront of the brand message that you were bringing out to the world, but were a strain in what you've been presenting and, and kind of, uh, you know, take disassociating that and, and kind of making something of that. Um, I think also, Bringing, bringing things down from the, the, the terrain where brands typically operate, which is, uh, you know, at 10,000 feet global, uh, uh, you know, ambition and, and, and kind of thinking about like broadcast to the world and making it local and human um, mm -hmm. and, and more immediate. So, you know, what a brand like Under Armour has been doing, you know, taking their marketing budget and um, uh, donated to feeding, feeding America, food banks around the country, but especially in Baltimore, um, and especially in places where they operate. I think that that kind of thinking uh, and and just bringing it down to to human interactions and conversations, um, kind of more than the, the the sweeping platforms and platitudes, uh, is probably what people are looking for right now. And, and Brad, that question of authenticity, like you said uh, before, I think is a, is a really significant one. Um, it's it's an interesting question. Like I said, I think a lot of people have seen that uh, the Budweiser spot that came out where uh, they matched the the uniforms of doctors and nurses and uh, grocery store workers and people who are really on the front lines of this right now to names of teams. It was a, a very well done uh, thing. It was also very in line with the type of thing that we would see from Budweiser, from Anheuser-Busch after 9-11, after a hurricane, after a, what, any of those types of things. How, what is the line between, you think, sort of doing good work, sending out a positive message, and the sort of virtue signaling that could turn off um, viewers and make, you, make it feel almost like brands or athletes are just trying to be opportunistic? Yeah, I, I think, you know, you, you make a really good point about Bud. You know, there are brands where we feel like we know the uh, DNA of a brand so well that you almost expect them to react in certain ways. And AB coming out and, you know, reallocating $5 million of their sports spend towards um, blood donation efforts is, is pretty in line with what you would expect. Um, and, and I think that's the key there. If you have a history of being a brand that acts in these, in these times of crisis, 
there's there's less reservation about making a virtuistic message. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if you're a brand that is either uh, has a different voice, you know, I, I personally work with a lot of brands where they're very tongue in cheek and playful in their marketing tactics. And for a brand like that, that relies on humor to, to pivot to a 180 and to position themselves as a leader throughout all of this crisis, I think that's a really tenuous place to play because you, you really risk, you know, consumers in 2020 are not dumb and they really, um, they're really skeptical of brands and, and, and the, the intentions behind them. So it's, it's, for brands that are not as cause related by nature, I think it's a really slippery slope for them. So I think know, knowing that there are certain brands that are just going to have to press pause no matter what, if you're a toilet paper brand right now, if you're a paper towel brand, you're, you're probably thinking that your effort should be really focused on keeping product on shelves. Um, but for brands that are not as known to be as, as, as aspirational, um, I think, you know, I think the, the way that they can reach out and tell a story is not, like I said before, it's just not selling a product. It's not trying to reach a certain demographic. It's just providing a message that people can relate to, that people can take for certain, some, some value. And you don't have to be the hero and you don't have to tout the fact that you're making masks um, 24-7. You can be a brand that just says, hey, we hear you. We know these are uncertain and scary times and we're doing X, Y, and Z to make your life a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, and I just want to remind you, we hopefully have a, a minute or two to sneak in a couple more questions to people before we're done. Uh, so if you have any, please feel free to leave them. Uh, Nate, along those lines, like it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting balance with athletes too, because obviously these are generally speaking uh, people in, in privileged situations, you know, you know, there are certain sports, certain athletes, you know, with guys make a little bit less, but the, the people we think of in these situations, um, they, their voice is important. I think of Marcus Smart or Carl Anthony Towns talking very publicly about either their, you know, in the case of Marcus Smart, his own uh, COVID test, and then uh, with, with Carl Anthony Towns, his parents. So it, it, it makes a difference when athletes are out there putting their stories in the front of people. Um, but at the same time, they want to fight that that issue of virtue signaling, making sense. So, is how how do you balance that with athletes between publicizing what you do because there is real value to it, and not looking like you're, you know, waving your hands and and, and making sure people see you. Yeah, I think um, a lot of athletes are using their platforms to mm-hmm. perform a greater good, and so. When, when Stephen Curry and his wife Aisha did um, a big campaign on, on Facebook and on IG to raise money for families in the Bay Area, um, they were both donating their own money and raising money from their communities. So I think a lot of, uh, a lot of the work is really bringing people's, using people's platforms and their communities um, to, to, to service. Um, and so that's, that's a big part of it. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's definitely a balance. And I don't think, you know, in, in the conversation we've been having um, with athletes, not every single one of them needs to be doing a, a big, you know, the, most of them are, are donating in some ways, um, right. as we've seen um, with, uh, you know, Giannis and, and others, who, or Zion and others who have covered, um, especially stadium workers pay. Um, but, you know, it, it's really about kind of finding your voice in this time and you know for an athlete partner like Carmelo Anthony um, it's something totally different than than that you know what he's been doing during this time is is entertaining people and connecting uh, we started a wine a series with him over Instagram live where he just has a glass of wine with different NBA players and they kind of talk about what they're going through um, and I think for a lot of people that's that's valuable and, and just to have some of their favorite personalities and, and be able to connect um, is, is is valuable as well yeah, yeah. It, it goes back go ahead Brad I just said it kind of goes back to that question of authenticity again yeah yeah Okay, so I, I would I would echo what Nate's saying. I don't think every I don't think every athlete out there needs to feel an obligation to go be Steph Curry. Um, I think there are athletes that I mean I think every athlete, especially athletes that have millions and millions of dollars, should be very sensitive to how they 
portray their journey throughout all of this because they're likely luckier than most. But I think, you know, a lot of players can can really just rely on the fact that fans want to feel connected to them. They want mm-hmm. to connect to them. And I think there's little things athletes can be doing on a daily basis, whether it's, you know, if it's a, a Derwin James who's a Madden pro, maybe he's inviting his fans to to come play with him as as, as athletes do often. Or maybe it's, you know, taking time to sign more autographs or, or, or send videos to fans. So I think those efforts, seeming small on paper, are still ways to make people feel normal and happy. And that is, that's still a valuable thing. And, and, and you know, it's, it's just, it, this is a really good opportunity for us to see athletes as humans and not these heroes that we embody them as. And, you know, I think it's, it's just been... It's just been super interesting to see how my perception of athletes has changed. And I think fans are sharing that. I think they're seeing that athletes are a little bit more human than we thought they were. Well, they're crazy right now, just like we are without Exactly. Them. Exactly. They're, they're, it's they're, rare that they can't go outside either. They can't go to the gym. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there's, there. there's, there's, there's an assumption uh, uh, across some fans that, you know, athletes don't care and that they're just in it for the money and that, you know, they don't have the passion that, that, you know, maybe a college player does. But I think what we're seeing is these athletes, while they're world-class athletes and they're millionaires, they, they love what they do and they're going crazy not being able to do it. And I think that kind of takes them down a level and puts them on a similar plane as a lot of their fans. And I think building on that and, and, and being more on that level and providing access to fans is just one little thing they can do while things are – kind of crazy right now yeah uh nate any final thoughts uh, on that as we kind of wrap up here one thing that i had had written down in my notes that i just hadn't touched on is um the relationship between brands and athletes is one um you know it, it's definitely being reshaped by this evolution of athletes and becoming creators known in their own message um, but the traditional relationship is one of endorsement and you know maybe the athlete shows up on a set of a commercial uh a couple times a year and and the relationship is is not much deeper than that but um i think the the brands who are working with talent and athletes at a deeper level in terms of partnering with them and their whole teams and kind of understanding what their mission is as athletes are seeing rewards during this period and i think it's a, it's a reminder that um, you know, for all brands, they should be looking again at their at these contracts and relationships, and 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 maybe reshaping them a lot around content partnerships. Let's work together on a series that the athlete's passionate about, instead of um, you know having them come out for a commercial shoot and, and thinking about using that time um, and that uh, yeah that that connection a little differently. That's a great point. Uh, well, we're we're up at the the end of our our time. I want to thank everybody who was able to ask questions. Apologies uh, that we couldn't get to them all. Uh, Nate Hodling, uh, co-founder, executive producer of Portal A. Brad Griffiths, uh, senior director of sports marketing at The Marketing Arm. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, and I'd like thank to thank everyone. Pete Lyon for, uh, for hosting today. Um, my Padres hat, we traded email yesterday. Couldn't believe I was, I was that Padre fan, but, but I am. And, oh. uh, but, but fortunately... Oh. This is my football team, so I, I had a pretty good year. Hey, I think it's a you know, fascinating conversation, you guys. Uh, you know, I think that the, the, the peak that we're getting into athletes' lives today and the authenticity of it may change the way athletes market themselves in the future. Um, we were all enamored with watching Roger Federer hit a tennis ball against the backboard in the snow yesterday. I don't know if you saw that, but how many people are like, wow, he's, he really loves to hit tennis balls. He's out in the snow, just had an operation a month ago. And, uh, and Shaquille O'Neal dancing in his kitchen with all of his kids. Um, these are peaks inside of, you know, the humanity of the, that these athletes are real people and we all feel like we're together and the, know that, that athletes are just like us. Um, it, it could change things a lot in the future. So I appreciate you guys very much. This has been a great conversation. Um, I hope we'll continue it. I think we could do a whole show on what happens with the NFL. Um, 
you know, are people going to flock to stadiums? What's the, the stadium, the game day experience going to be for the NFL going forward? You know, what's the, the media planning? Um, I hope you guys will join us again. Brian, I hope you'll come back and host again uh, to sure. our audience. Uh, I've got time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll use it. Yeah. Uh, to the audience, any, any suggestions you have on future shows that you'd like to see, uh, guests you'd like us to bring in, we're here for you. So talk to us. Let us know what we can do. Thanks, everybody. Be safe. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank Bye. you.